Okay. We're going to deal with the females of the, the greatest man of world color. This is a book, uh, uh, the volume one. This is a book by J.A. Rogers, one of the great historians, a master grand master teacher. In this part of the book, we're going to deal with two people right now. The male and the female aspect, which every African should be try to emulate. And this part of the book is called Celebrities Before Christ. We're an ancient people. We go back way before then. There is no Christ in our judgment. And the first one we're going to start off with is the female Hashepsu. You know, that's the first one we're going to start off with. J. Rogers called us the most ablest queen in far activity, in antiquity. And her name is Hashepsu, as you see. So let's go down and get down to this reading. Hashepsu of ancient Egypt was the greatest female ruler of all time, according to some Egyptologists. Among those, she was dominated by her brother, Tutmosis III, the Napoleon of Fire Antiquity. She also had been the first woman in history to challenge the supremacy of the male that are warred against her in more than 3,000 years of masculine tradition. There was no word for queen, according to J.A. Rogers, there was no word for queen or empress in the language of her day. So when she came along, she was the first one done with the title queen or empress. That's a black woman, an African woman, an African queen or African empress. And that's what we should hold our daughters and our women to that standard, our nieces and our cousins or whatever title, our females to that standard. Let's keep going. But she fought her way to power and held the throne of the world then leading empire for 33 years. Hatshepsut lived for 150 years before Tutankhamun and 3,500 years ago. Her father, Tutmosis I, was conqueror of the known world. He was then stricken with paralysis. Hatshepsut became a chief aide and so sufficient did he prove had Tutmosis in a time and entrusted her with the management of the kingdom and made her co-ruler. When Tutmosis called the Dombas together, he offered, he said to them, Daughter, come in among Hatshepsut, the loving one, I place, put in my place. Henceforth, she shall guide you. Listen to her words and submit and honor me to her commands. Whoever adores her, I will adore. Who speaks evil against her majesty will die. And as you see, here's a picture of Hatshepsut. It's a lot more pictures with her with different colors and stuff like that. Usually she's black and dark skin, but these are the pictures we're dealing with. Let's keep on going. Together, father and daughter traveled over the empire, receiving homage, offering sacrifice in the temples, and erecting monuments and buildings, improving industry and agriculture. But Hatshepsut has several rivals. One, principally the two sons of Tammoses, one of whom, later Tammoses II, was born of a wife, not of royal birth, and was a minor, and the other, Tammoses III, the son of a slave named Asnut. Tammoses III, hoping to ask Hatshepsut, stays the trick in the temple of Amun to demonstrate that he, not she, was elected by of God. While he was in prayer one day in a secluded part of the temple, he had the priest procession which bore a glittering image of the supreme god, Amun Ra. Swerve suddenly into the main aisle, and as is drawn by some unseen force, come towards him, where he fell and prostrated to the ground, as if in a, in a trance. It was then the priest declared that God Himself stepped out of the shrine, and raised Tammuz to Alexis, concluded to him the innermost altar where only Pharaoh could tread, and bade him to rule over Egypt. This plot was extremely effective, and it had shifted his face with the alternative of war or compromise with Tammuz. She ended up marrying him. The reason why they got married because they keep the bloodline tight. You know what I'm saying? So it's a pure blood on, on the throne. I know we look at her as wicked and stuff like that, but that way it was just concluded of a pure blood. So she solidified her position by doing this. The two now put their father off the throne, but the old lion reasserted him and drove them both off and made Tammuz II the real heir ruler. 
The latter, however, was by all accounts weakling and died. It's believed by assassination. At this point, much of the recorded record is lost, and there's a gap in the story of perception. When we hear next of her, she's again on the throne with Tadmos III, who is now so strong he is able to restrict her to the position of royal chief wife. However, by skillful entry, she not only restored herself as co-ruler, but finally thrusted him in the background as a mere husband. So she took control, threw him in the background as a mere husband, who was inferior to her prime minister, Nishu, N-E-H-U-S-I, which in Egyptian means full-blooded Negro, according to J.A. Rogers. The name again is the prime minister is Nashu, N-E-H-U-S-I, which in Egyptian means full-blooded Negro. Hatshepsut put on another another handicap besides the fact of sex. She had another handicap besides the fact that she was being a female, namely ancestry. On her father's side, she was not pure Thebian stock. Through her mother, she was. Her enemies, the priests of Amun, of Amun, seized on this tank in the lineage and plotted to dethrone her. To offset this, she began to publicize herself in the most sensational manner of the time by building temples, pyramids, obelisks, and sizes of grandeur which regarded by the popular mind as a gauge of every ruler of power. Accordingly, as Shepsu decided to build a temple, the like of which the world has never seen, and sent her chief architect, Semu, S-E-M-U-T, who by all appearances was a full-blooded Negro, together to choose a site which is not of their appropriate, which is not only appropriate, but strategic. This was the elevation three miles away from the stronghold of her opponents, the Temple of Amun-Ra. From this site, her temple looked down upon theirs. Under Satmu's genius, Hashesu Temple had developed into what is known as one of the remote world most remarkable specimens of architecture. We still, I think, it still exists today. It's built into like a um, thing, but we gonna see. It had frontage of 800 feet, and it was the most part of it was hollowed out of a great cliff that overlooked it. Yep, this is built inside of a cliff. It's cold. This is real. You know, you see, just seeing pictures of it, it's like, damn, that shit is real cold. You know, he was, you know, he really did something for it. That's built by a black, you know, commanded to be built by a black woman. The first one with the title called Queen. Double and triple rows column line the entrance, and as they approach, a remarkable normal statues and wonderful terraces and prayer rites of guard. Colorful inscription decorate the interior, which abound with active cultural novelties. Not content with this, Hatshepsut decided to carry her triumph into the very camp of her detractors. She ordered to be made two obelisks taller than any other in Egypt. Each was hewed with a mighty block of rose granite, and when complete, it took two great rafts, each manned by 900 men, to train it down a, transport it down the river Nile. Hatshepsut descended these gifts to the temple of Amen Ra, but very astutely, she had ordered them made so tall that they were hired in the temple, whose rim now known as Karnak, whose ruins now known as Karnak, revealed it to be one of the most colossal constructions ever made by man. Accordingly, to make the objects fit, the roof of the temple had to be open, and from which Hashesu objects reared their head as a chimney over the roof. But that was not all. To make the objects still more conspicuous, she had their tops encased on Electronium E L E C T R U, a metal costlier than gold. Electronium, according to J. A. Rogers, was composed of silver and gold. Silver being rarer than gold in ancient Egypt was more precious. So that tell you how much gold we had. Silver was much more precious than gold. So it was gold everywhere. That's just how we was living. You know what I'm saying? Let's continue on. In the bright sunlight of the rainless obelisk, shone like glittering peaks. Their brand seen in Queen's own in the Queen's own world lit up the land, the two lands of Egypt. You know the two lands, Upper Egypt, Nubia, and Lower Egypt, or Kemet. You know, lower Upper Kemet, Lower Kemet. Lower Kemet is more towards the Meridian to Mer Meridian Sea or what they call the Great Sea. 
Whenever a resident is a thief or a visitor look out upon a city, the most dazzling sight he saw was no longer the temple of Amen Ra, but her obelisk. When people entered her temple, they read on them this engraving. O ye people, who shall see my monument in the ages to come, beware of the saying, I do not, I do not. Why that is, why this is made in, in my own fashion entirely from gold. These two islands, my majesty, have wrought that my name may abide enduring in this temple forever and ever. The queen popularity increased and she became firmly established. Great prosperity came to the land and the gold was plentiful. It no longer weighed, but it measured by the bushel of the basket. So we had so much, she had brought in so much gold and was producing so much gold that you know how you couldn't weigh it no more. You had to bring it by the bushel in the basket. This is the kind of people, you know, females we need to, you know, we need to be raising up. With the intelligence and the beauty and the mindset. But let's keep on going about Hashepsu. Because now she's making the kingdom prosperous. Let's see. She wrote in her own praise. It came to pass that her majesty was increased above all things. Was beautiful to look at above all things. Her voice was that of a God. Her fame was that of a God. Her spirit was like a God. It came to pass she was a beautiful maiden. But despite all this, she was still a woman with a masculine prejudice against her. To overcome it, she boldly announced that she was really a man. Despite all this, <laughs> she was still a woman with a masculine prejudice. To overcome this, she boldly announced that she was really a man. That's according to J.A. Rogers. Whether Egypt was startled, we do not know, but this step crushed all further opposition. She donned male guard, changed the name from Hashef's to S-I-T-U to Hashef's to S-U-T and its male equivalent, and announced that she was a virgin birth. Another virgin birth story. This is before Christ, before this Jesus stuff came around. A virgin birth. And now she's the birth of a virgin. Her father declared, her father, she declared, was not Tahmosis the first, but the great Amen, God Amen himself. The latter had pretended to be her appear to her mother in a flood of light and perfume. That's the initiation of Christianity. You gotta understand that's the initiation how to learn, you know what I'm saying? How to stuff come out. The whole story and his most intimate bedroom details were painted on the walls of her temple and may still be seen. The child shown being born of this union is a boy. Thereafter, her sculptures po showed her, sculpture portraits, portraits showed her with a man chest and beard. She also took the title of the king of the north and the south. Kamara, Horus of gold, bestower of ears, conqueror of all lands, virulent fire of hearts, chief spouse of Amen, and the mighty one. But the feminine in her cropped up when she wrote of herself. His majesty herself put her own hands of oil of Ani on her limbs. Her fragrance was like divine breath. Her scent reaches as far as the land of Punt. Her skin is the pure of gold. Is that a pure gold? It shines like the stars in the halls of the festival in view of the whole land. She has no equal among the gods who were before and since the world was. She, living Ra. So she's saying she's the living God. Eternally, he has selected her for protecting Egypt, for rousing bravery of man. I rule this land like a son of Isis. I am mighty like the son of Nu. I shall forever light the stars, which changes not. Had Sheps was in an expedition to distant land, what of them was Punt, Mary special attention. Punt was a traditional home of early Egyptians and located somewhere in East Africa. The mission entrusted to her three favorites, Nashuti, the unmixed Negro who spoken of her in the inscription as Prince Chancellor, her first friend, and wearing the collar, Shamu, the architect who was depicted of holding the queen's infant daughter, Neferora, on his knees, and Tahui, 
her treasurer. They left with five vessels of 300 tons each. Mm. In return were gold, myrrh, and incense, and incense bearing trees, strange animals, and other products of that region. Her full story of this expedition may be read on the walls of her temple at Denarab el Bar. In the 15th year of her reign, or the 30th year of her rule, she held a jubilee. Her husband, Timosis III, was permitted to burn a little incense to Amen Ra as he joined the possession. She triumphantly wrote, I have no enemies in all land, in all the land. All countries are my subject. He, Amen Ra, has made boundaries to the extremities of heaven. The circus of the sun have labored for me. At last she died. Her end was hastening. So she had no enemies in the land. At last that she died. Her ends has to perhaps by Thomas Hosea III, succeeded to the throne. He killed off her friends, defaced her sculptures, chipped her features from her damn, chipped her features from her portrait, and wore her idolists. In doing so in such thoroughness, she was forgotten for three hundred years. In nineteen oh six, an American excavator, Theodore Davis, discovered her tomb and amazed the world with the story of this remarkable woman, a worthy predecessor of Elizabeth, Joan of Arc, and Catherine the Great. Hatshepsut's mother, Nafatari Amos, was Ethiopian. So she was very dark-skinned, as I said before. Her mother was an Ethiopian. And is shown in a portrait to be very black. In addition, Hatshepsut was of some Southern Egyptian ancestry, which was and still very much unmixed with pure Negroes of the Sudan, where the Egyptian, where the territory is adjoined to Egypt. Like, so she was basically an upper Nubian, you know, which is tied to Sudan and the Nubian Egyptian. Of a conceptual in her temple, Rock Hickman says, Hicken says, to me the most feminine she seen was when I saw her at the temple of Elder Ra Bashar. With the brightness, and the suavity and the pretty and the shallowness and the sunshine is white and blue and yellow, green, red, green, orange, and very trim and factual and fanciful. All very smart and delicate, full of finesse and laughter, breathing out at me of the 20th century, this courtly woman of 1500 BC. At the terrific masculinity, masculinity of Manhattan Obu, and after the freedom of Rasa Simon and a grandeur of Colossus, the manhood of the ages constructed in, in granite, the temple of Al of Darabia Albaco, came upon me like a delicate woman perfumed and arranged and clothed in a creation of white and blue, orange extended forever, so ever since so ever knowingly against the background of pink, orange and pink, red and brown, smiling the quartet up on the mountains, a gay, sweet and trinitous, who knew her pretty powers and meant to exercise them. A radiant queen reigns here, a queen of fantasy and splendor, and divine mountain shallowness where fire, flock, and literally cut into the mountains. Instead of being uplifted or overrated by a form, we are rejoiced by color and by the sweet veracity of the arrested movement. By the story that the color of the movement tells, it is over there by a bright blue painted sky. Studded almost distractedly by the stud of plethora, studded with a plethora of yellow stars of the Egyptian like starfish. Through this most characteristic temple, one rose in the gallery, attentive and moved feeling all the time, Hashem's fascination. One thing that seems certain, Hashem held her own until the last. Her tomb was discovered in the Valley of King, her, her tomb was discovered in the Valley of King, where only lordly males were buried. The queens had a burial place in her own. Hatshepsut dear was to live in memory of mankind. To the Egyptian, that was true immortality. That she have achieved, and that she had achieved is for graven and precious granite. Her story is now refreshed and fascinating as it was written 35 centuries ago. So, this is the story of Hatshepsut, according to J.A. Rogers. And after the first woman, according to J. Rogers, to be named queen or empress, there was no such title before Hashapsu came along. Now, it was chief royal wife, 
but there was no title of Queen of Empress. This the first, the second person is in his book, The World Greatest Man of Color. And he talks about her as a second person. You get the second person in this book who all African queens, females should emulate. So that's how it goes. We're gonna get more on this, this, this book and the Grandmaster historian, J.A. Rogers. We're gonna start off with this book right here. Grandmaster teaching. I know some things gonna be improved and some things gonna be changed, but we're gonna look at it from J.A. Rogers, what he wrote at that time. For it wasn't no J.A. Rogers and you know, no George Will Parker, there would not be no us. And we know Dr. Benz, and we know Dr. John Henry Clarks. There would be a lot of us. So we gotta pay homage to these guys and keep on going back. Joel Augustus Rogers, hotel.